everyone. Hopefully uh, my voice is loud and clear. I'm on my balcony right now and it's starting to snow here in Otoko, Canada. Honestly, for this episode, I just want to share an observation I've made on emotions. <clears throat> and um, pretty much the role and value of emotions in human civilization and the natural world. For the title I've written, Without Expectation, There Is No Emotion. You know, we hear a lot of people, you know, recommend that a, a person has to get in tune with their own emotional reality. You know, human beings, we're such complex and, I would say, to some degree, from the past, if you look at it, we're such advanced organisms that alongside a physical outer life, every person has simultaneously an inner life. And that inner life constitutes of the various moments where consciousness took the moment as an ultimate reality. <clears throat> you know, we're living in a world where people are fighting over truth. where there are hierarchical systems, so many different kinds of spectrums. And we are, our eyes are pilots of our life. Our sight is in some sense pilot of us. To me it occurred that I asked the question for myself, I'm, I'm not claiming to be the most uh, emotionally conscious person. <laughs> There's so many things that um, sometimes in this life I look at and I'm like, you know, it's, it's not, uh, my eyes will never go there. But <clears throat> I have, as a human being, uh, wondered about the origin of thought and after we've uh, come to any sort of, let's say, analytical conclusion, we're left having an emotion. You know, it's as if uh, I, I've been in these talks talking about, you know, uh, an outer self, an outer objective self, and an inner subjective self, and how there's the outer realms and the inner realms, but simultaneously there's also an emotional level to life. You know, it's as if we are designed to appear as if we are bodies, but in reality, we are an observing moment. It's as if uh, I remember from the beginning of my life, just any conscious moment, uh, any memory I have. It's as if I was not just in the room of that moment, I was the room of that moment. I'm trying to say that the mind is like our whole moment and our bodies in it when it comes to uh, a, a conscious uh, when it comes to the acknowledgement of consciousness you know there have been scholars who have said it's like it was an incredible moment where the species became aware that it is aware we were so conscious well, I should say it this way we have been from an evolutionary view uh, consciousness has existed, but for consciousness to notice that it's being consciousness, that took a very long time. Now, the point where we all are right now, anybody who's alive in 2022, <clears throat> it's as if the reaction we have to what happens uh, projects the emotions. And I tested, like, to, honestly, the title for this episode, it was like, it's a very recent uh, insight for me. Where I just realized if I don't have an expectation on something, I don't have an emotion about it. You know, when it, when it comes to, let's say, a person 
giving a talk in front of millions of people, the person gets, let's say, nervous, and that nervousness is because in the inner realms, uh, the, the mind has lived ahead and is considering the probabilities, and those probabilities suggest an emotional uh, response. So in some sense, it's the vision of the future that, gener that uh, uh, causes this human experience to generate an emotional dimension to life. I feel what we call emotions can also be seen as like layers of thoughts. It's as if, um, the, so think of it this way, in front of your eyes, just one outer self, behind your eyes, that means if a person closes their eyes miraculously, they can still see. <laughs> you know, they see their memories, they're visualizing. Pretty much, I'm trying to lead this episode towards why, when there is no expectation, there is no emotion, and in some sense, what causes an expectationless state to, to not be turbulent in regards to psychological position. Right now, as I'm talking, there's like, you know, a mini war happening on the planet. And it is a suggestion that he, the species, as it's overpopulating, in some sense, it needs to get. Uh, there needs to be a more advanced system or structure. You know, it's as if human beings have to acknowledge that they are multidimensional behind their eyes, and in front of their eyes, they're in a singular dimension. If the species cannot acknowledge this, there will be, of course, a lot of turbulence. But where does expectation come into this? Expectation is a connection to the future of that which is outside of ourself. I think about it in this sense that, uh, I'll go back to the metaphor I was saying, somebody talking in front of millions of people and they haven't, they're suddenly in their inner realms, there's an expectation of, okay, how's this going to go? And then somebody pouring water in a glass or getting a glass uh, cup from the cupboard and pouring water in there, right? So it's as if there is, the person is so certain that the action is simple when it comes to the glass of water that they don't get nervous at all. They don't get nervous, oh my God, I opened the tap. You know, it's like, oh, this is so in emotionally intense. It's like none of that is there because the person has a fixed conclusion. It's as if moments in life where we have accepted their nature, they do not uh, create fluctuations behind our eyes. They don't, the psychology is stable. You know what it is? It's, it's in some sense human psychology at least. It's a balance game. That means it's the yin yang symbol is so accurate it's kind of you know mind blowing <clears throat> that it's as if in the most chaotic dimension there will be uh, the smallest uh, you there would there would be let's say in ma in a macro chaotic dimension there will be micro order and in a macro order dimension there will be micro chaos. It's honestly the inner realms, how our inner life runs quicker into the destiny of the moment than our body does. I could just see it even when I'm speaking right now. It's as if these words, they are followers of inner events that take place, with at least within my psyche. So pretty much when you don't have an expectation, you're, there is no emotional connection to something, you know. I think it's the same with caring and not caring. You know, there is a lot of, <laughs> how would I say it, a lot of people in the New Age community or in certain 
oral traditions where uh, knowledge before it was passed down by writing it was pretty much people relaying it so so the guru disciple relationship pretty much in history think about all the different cultures that implemented that right it's as if we hear a lot about the guru uh, position as if oh man look at this guy acting like he's on the top but we don't hear from how the top sees in in some sense the bottom right it's always how the bottom sees the top or how the limited is looking at the limitless not how the limitless is looking at the limited you know <clears throat> anyways the point of that <laughs> is that the expectation for something and the possibility of something creates emotional openness if you tell someone you know uh, if you press this button you're gonna get let's say millions of dollars right and that person suddenly feels like oh my god it's like they were tired not not caring for anything and suddenly when the idea came of a probable future then their emotions were part of the animation process of the intelligence of the human being. You see, this, this world is so fascinating that first thing we know is the biggest clue we have to its nature is that it has unknown dimensions. And wherever there are unknown dimensions, it, it pretty much, it's another way of saying all linguistic truth is on thin ice. It's another way of saying that our certainty is temporary. You know, in a changing world. I mean, think about it. A lot of the wars that have begun it, 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 in history, it has become... Uh, wars began in the minds of people. You know, war is kind of like... Uh, it's lifeless, but it is the minds that go towards seeing it even as a possibility where it suddenly is animated. <clears throat> you know? <clears throat> And so there is a dimension of fear, of course. It's as if like we can't suddenly expect like we're gonna sleep and wake up and suddenly the whole species has prioritized unconditional uh, love and freedom over you know uh, conditional you know uh, value systems and playing in like playing hunger games. Anyways, I'll take this back more to a personal angle. You know, every person that lives, they get exposed to landscapes of shape. To me, that, that is what life is. I, I perceive it primarily if somebody was like, hey, Mr. Within, what archetype um, would you give your mind? You know, I would say more like you know, a designer and a pilot. Those are the angles I see myself. The reason I, I have, let me, I can say that I open my eyes through the vision of design is that emotionals become linking. It's as if an emotion, just like metal, wielding metal, <coughs> or, or excuse me, welding metal, it's, it's, it's like emotions weld inner events with outer events. An example of this would be imagine you're young, like there's a young child, and this young child suddenly is pushed for no reason. Just pushed like some aggression comes without any reason. So the child has uh, <coughs> suddenly, ex or uh, here, I'll give this example I've given in other talks. Imagine there's this kid playing chess with his father and then the father, the kid is about to do checkmate, and before the kid does checkmate, the father slaps like like breaks the whole chessboard. Do you know? Like not break it, but <laughs> you know, like slaps the pieces off the chessboard, like responds in anger. Now this child, imagine forty years later, suddenly is playing chess with his own son, and when his son is about to checkmate him, he suddenly slams like the chessboard. Right? 
<clears throat> and so it's as if like an expectation uh, you know what it is it's as if uh, we are this observing intelligence as the moment we have access to inner past moments of life which we call memories and so it's as if like it's as if we're in an iron man suit and this iron man suit has past programming But there is, of course, free will. Like, that's my whole point, that there is a decision made, and then suddenly the emotions arise. You know, whether it's a subconscious decision where that's shock more. <clears throat> but if there's a conscious decision made, at least the person chooses what emotion to have. You know, religions, and I shouldn't just point out religion, just strict ideological systems if you pay attention, what they're doing on this planet is they're telling the human how to be human. The past has this thing where it, because it cares for the future, it is trying to correct the future. I feel this is deep, even on an evolutionary level. I mean, think about it. It's, it's as if, like, we, we think that human beings are just born in one world. But imagine that he, every human being born is born in two worlds. And <clears throat> when you think about survival of the fittest, those beings, those creatures on the planet who could for a second put away their inner realm and look at the outer realm and then reanimate, rekindle their inner realms from the outer realms, they had greater survival. Uh, uh, they got to see their lineages, you know. What I'm trying to say is that uh, life is divided, not just in front of our eyes, but also behind our eyes. The psychology of a human being, <clears throat> pretty much consciousness, is like a recording camera. The, bio, the brain is the camera's hardware. The personality is like the software in the camera. The free will is the user of the camera, outside of the camera. You know, this is pointing more to the presence of the soul beyond the bodies, beyond the body and minds uh, fathoming. Ultimately, in my analysis of everything, I'm this person who's concluded that when it comes to physical life, the greatest thing we can do in the outer realms is to build an advanced civilization or at least for the species to have a wonder, what would it look like, how would it be like, do you know? <clears throat> Even if we built an advanced civilization and it lasted just a day, do you know? It's as if that would be at the same time worth the whole journey. So in the outer realms physically, in the outer life, the greatest thing that 8 billion physical creatures on a rock hovering in the middle of some gigantic mystery, <laughs> mysterious void, is that we uh, try, to f try to experience the most... Uh, when I say advanced, this doesn't mean just technological. <clears throat> when I say advanced, I mean in, in all dimensions uh, uh, that uh, the human being's attention has outreach. For the inner realms, in order to uh, preserve the banner of enlightenment, but also to uh, advance uh, modern psychology, for the inner realms, I have considered that it took us so long to evolve, and why do we have mouths and bodies and uh, an ability to create sound? It's, it's like... 
<clears throat> and ears like it's as if we are designed for communication you know we are designed to uh, learn from each other's worlds in some sense or learn from each other's worlds that uh, are behind each person's eyes Now, take this in, that if we want an advanced civilization in the outer realms, uh, there, that's a great expectation. That is one of the most, I feel, for a species to build an advanced civilization, it is the most, it is the epitome of an emotional task. brings forth a hypersensitivity which in some cases can make a person go into a sort of ideological par uh, paralysis. What I mean is that In the outer realms, emotions are not primary. There's a level to life which is purely existential. If you think about even the concept of purpose through the lens of existence, everybody by existing has fulfilled their existential purpose. Do you know? So there's an existential level, <clears throat> and then there is an experiential level to life. And based on how we as an, think of it this way, as an unknown experiencer, pilot through this known world, known landscape, emotions are how the outlets of expression are sculpted. If a person has, let's say they go through something, a very joyous experience, but they experience pain, you know, it's, it's like, it, or let's say somebody touches fire, right? And their hand burns, it's as if they instantly, you know, it's as if there is an emotion connected. <clears throat> There's an emotion connected to that event. And the next time the person goes around fire, why don't they touch it? Because the emotion has become a sort of guidepost. talk steering towards the role of emotions in an advanced civilization but something I want to still say about the present <clears throat> is that even the concept of professionalism if you think about it you know if a person is emotional in a professional setting it's as if it's a sign of uh, weakness it is a sign of ignorance too it's kind of like the same thing how in the Godfather movies, it's like you don't, you know, emotionally outburst at the business table, you know. <laughs> you know? It, it, <clears throat> so, so anyways, what I'm trying to say is that here's the cool thing about life, that who each person is, is actually a hidden inner life. And as they function in the outer realms, it is their choice what they animate and activate what they choose to believe and think of it this way that in every moment the outer realms is like just instant reality and your mind whatever this mind is and whatever it harbors that's an overlay of reality upon reality so it's a decision every moment a person makes a decision you know and that decision is either orchestrated by uh, either uh, it's either the inner realms that are um, holding truth or the outer realms <clears throat> you know um, let's say there's a um, you know professional refrigerator salesman okay <laughs> and this refrigerator salesman you know this this let's say family's coming to buy a refrigerator and let's say somehow in this 
let's say, hypothetical situation, right? There's this next level refrigerator and this, you know, new salesman has to sell it, okay? <laughs> now, let's say the people walk in, they're like, okay, what's good about this new uh, refrigerator? And the refrigerator salesman opens the door of the refrigerator and says, this refrigerator, you know, mysteriously appeared and it has a stargate inside. Imagine there's like a mini stargate inside the refrigerator you know <laughs> so you know and then the couple's like i don't know it's like do we need a stargate in our refrigerator they're thinking it right and let's say whatever in let's say through an analytical approach and logical approach it is to the to the couple it's like okay yeah uh it's like it makes sense to buy this refrigerator but suddenly the person's like i don't like the color though i want this refrigerator right <laughs> and this and the refrigerator salesman look at what happens in the in that inner realm right where the refrigerator salesman has to in some sense put the inner it's as if you put aside your own emotions to accompany the emotions outside of you do you know it, it's it's as if it's a disconnect you know um it's as if a person who's who doesn't have an expectation on how something's gonna happen, they can't get hurt. That's part of the nature of psychology. And you know what's strange about this world we live in? Some moments when you stop actually from the inner realms, you stop caring, suddenly in the, in the, in the outer realms, things animate differently, you know? But again, there is this whole selective process of how our attention moves and uh, how, how much of it we choose to express, you know? It's as if um, there's this, um, I remember in this video game, there was this character that uh, this character had just, there was a voice actor for it and this character had a saying. And this character would say, emotions are distractions, you know? <laughs> Pretty much the point was that uh, when one has a professional intent, their own emotions are not disturbing the direct analysis of the moment. And honestly, I feel the scientific mind is training itself for that, you know? It's as if when you look at human beings, uh, I mean, sure, if you take a snapshot and say, okay, who was this person in this moment? You know, you have a sort of fixed, let's say you can categorize the identity. But if you look at it as if it's a film, as if nobody ever knows who they are to their last breath. If you identify with a changing world, you are actually the viewer of it an attributeless viewer of all the different attributes and ways the self is animated from the beginning of life to now. And there is so much wisdom about emotions that I am telling you, like there's so many YouTube channels out there, you know? There's so many human beings that have just have an emotional understanding of reality that surpasses any sort of analysis, you know. The thing about emotions, though, is that they are sometimes, if the emotion is intense, a sort of possession. Like, for example, when it comes to anger, uh, at least in my life, um, uh, I have not had a problem with anger simply because even if it arises, it's situational. It's situational. What that means is that, um, <clears throat> again, think of that kid who his father like slapped the chessboard. You know, that example I was saying earlier. When that kid gets angry,
It's as if that kid is not living in the present. Anger is when the inner life has convinced you of the destiny of the outer, the outcome of the outer. You know, and it's not that it, I could say it this way because it's a dualistic kind of outer realm, uh, reception of an outer realm. Um, it's not that there's just, it's like nobody can say emotions are good or bad. We have good emotions and bad emotions based on the outcomes they create, do you know? But uh, in reality, it's like when we, even the statement that somebody is an emotional person, it's as if it's again that whole snapshot modality. The thing I have learned in this life that any picture I have on any human being is a, a sort of carcass of an imp impression. It's as if there is a, every day that we wake up, the life force has a choice on how we treat reality, how we receive reality. To me, it has been strange, you know, it's, it's like this game of good and evil was very important when I was young, you know, <clears throat> trying to be a good person and trying to stay away from the bad. But, but in reality, what it is, is that it's piloting in space. Can, it's as if sometimes when I look at a, I mean animals could be like you know so many different discussions like arguments can be made for this and it's counter what I'm saying but um, when I look at lesser species they don't have emotional turmoil at the level of that the human being has it's as if the human being uh, fathoms or, or, or considers mortality and the consideration of mortality suddenly projects an intensity that you're here for a limited time, you know. But when you look at other animals, you know, in nature, it's as if they are not burdened. It's as if, you know, like, you know, fish don't care about what time it is. Emotions are, we can say, uh, how one's nature, one's true nature, copes with the changes of the world. If a person has an expectation, then in some sense they care for the future of something. Now, is it possible for a human being in a changing world, or let me say it, for a creature in a changing world, to have no expectation? <laughs> As long as there is a body, it's impossible. The thing is that when we wake up, we are energy. And this energy has the privilege of a, let's say, biological mobility. But for example, when in certain dreams, in certain dream states of mine, when I've slept and in the, I've awakened in a dream, in those dreams, the emotion was very different. It's as if uh, it's like uh, a nightmare doesn't become uh, it's like because we we on some level feel that dreams are not real they don't in they they do influence but they don't influence us that much 
Now, the expectation on phenomena does come from a worldview. I feel that um, when, when you look at human personality, it's like a domino. It's like a domino that was pushed. So it's as if the consciousness of the child had to emerge with some individual point of being. So exa an example would be a child looks in the mirror and realizes that what's in the mirror is itself. That's like the first domino. Then the next moment of consciousness, next moment of consciousness, then the child hears its name. Another, do you see what I'm saying? It's like the dominoes are being placed as time goes on and uh, uh, we move in this reality to, to be something. <clears throat> Now, if we were to reverse engineer where the expectation on reality comes from, it comes from, I think it, honestly, its roots are in the subconscious, but as far as the edge of the conscious mind can go, it is an acceptance of the first context for the world. So, anyways, I think I've, you know, uh, talked about uh, certain examples enough. I'll say this. <clears throat> With the title being without expectation, there is no emotion. Emotions are still a mystery. Because many things in this life are still a mystery. When we forget life is a mystery, the inner realms becomes limited, and then the limited inner realms tries to, in every moment of the outer realm, limit the outer realm. I've had this th uh, concern for myself even where uh, I'm writing this book called Civilization 2.0, and it's pretty much my the totality of my efforts for what I feel an advanced civilization or a path to an advanced civilization would be like. And after come pretty much the, uh, the content, the, after having some sort of vision of, for the future, I wondered, is it right, is it wrong? And how many other types of advanced civilizations could there be? It's the same thing where when the Wright brothers uh, made the airplane, right? It's as if before they made the airplane and the airplane was chosen as like the main form of sky travel, you know. <laughs> there were other methods of flight. And the moment where there was one winner, everybody forgot about the rest. So it could be that um, in any moment of life, there's so many different ways to approach the moment that eventually we're left in an all-you-can-eat buffet of inner probabilities of reality. All you can accept, <coughs> you know, uh, probabilities of reality in our mind. But eventually, I have considered that because of the limited time that the human biology is here, it deserves to experience, pretty much human beings deserve to see and experience what an advanced civilization would be like. Even if people in right now, I'm giving this talk and let's say nobody cares, right? They're like, I don't have time for an advanced civilization, Mr. Ruth, what do you say? <laughs> I would say eventually it will come. Eventually there will be people on this planet where they will see the potential of advancement and they have no other choice other than to communicate. Now, if we want 8 billion human beings to build an advanced civilization, and just like that refrigerator example where at the end of the logical analysis of what the product is, you, you're making an emotional analysis, and the emotional analysis is your expectation with how your inner self is experiencing the product before you've bought it. Again, the whole thing of emotions is that if there was no notion of future, you would be emotionless. The past is past. You know, the past is even generating, you know, reasons for us to have emotions about new moments, present and new moments.
So, eight billion creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Imagine uh, a group of advanced communicators and pilots of consciousness, as I've envisioned. They decide to bring forth an advanced civilization. They realize that there has to be a professionalism, a sort of disconnect, not in all dimensions of life, but when it comes to the main story that human beings are living in. If, it is, if the story of the world is a bad story, is an inefficient story, then the character is in an inefficient world. And that is what we're seeing. We are seeing, it's as if they tell people to be virtuous, but we're not seeing on a global level nations being virtuous. And the reason because of it, the reason of that is fear you see it's as if it's like the fear of not at being able to access a specific reality is causing uh, 8 billion creatures on a planet to in some sense have indecent and inefficient moments so to me the first task of let's say an effort towards an advanced civilization would be to establish an ethos, would be in some sense to have a world story and have all media. Just think about this. Think about what I'm saying as if it was a parallel probable version of Earth, where every human being had suddenly a value system uh, uh, that was uh, uh, basking in the honor of what the greatest potential of every moment of life could be. You see, for billions of years, I shouldn't say billions, but okay, here, 4.5 billion years for us to get here. Now the evolution of, of the organism on this rock, let's say that took a certain time. And all this time, we have been functioning unconsciously. A majority of evolution was just nature doing the work. Now, for the first time, fragments of nature, which call themselves human beings, can begin consciously doing the work in a completely different, uh, with a completely different ability. So the human being begins adopting a framework of wondering first what the most advanced self would look like and then wondering what the most advanced world uh, what would be the most advanced world that that self at most advanced self deserves and when you have this attitude i feel there comes a royalty from an existential energetic situation it's as if if our on if our if expectations are creating emotions and human beings are emotional entities so that means it's unavoidable to just have everybody be cloned in one emotion all right uh, you know a utopia of everybody being just one emotion you know it's like that's a sort of dismissing of all the other dimensions that there are. So it would be in some sense an average human being being like, okay, in the outer realms, the advanced civilization is far away, but in the inner realms, the behavior of a human being in a civilization can become advanced. You know, there I, I got this very profound realization years ago that when it comes to the value of something or the worth of something, it is a choice. If somebody behaves in a weak way, it's because that is the reality that they have chosen. If somebody acts in a strong way, it, it's the reality they have chosen. And the weakness and the strength, they take the same energy. It's like an instant. You know, there's this saying that says, I don't know who said it, but it was something like, um, and when you make up your mind, strength comes. So strength comes from a made up mind. Which is another way of saying, the moment you decide on the value of the context of your world behind your eyes, then the advanced part opportunity is in reach. This is why I dislike the whole teacher, student, guru, disciple thing. The reason of it is because there is no time. 
there is no time not to have every human being uh, having an advanced expression. Now, what what like the definition of advanced means is really orbiting the major concept of novelty. You see, the past has passed, the present has nowhere to go, and the future has not arrived. The future is the role of the human being. You see, it's as if we are the brain of the planet, if other species on the planet are different organs, you know? It's as if we are administering uh, Spaceship Earth. And if we had this attitude where there is 8 billion crew members, every crew member's responsibility to, in some sense, handle a certain part of, you know, the planetary spaceship. It's like there's a value in everything. Every moment can be become advanced if there is an, an original intent to care for the potential of something. <clears throat> you know, a reason where I decided that, okay, forget my own desires, emotional desires, and let all the episodes of the channel be public, was because to me it was way more exciting to see a movement of advancement in the outer realms rather than one sitting in an inner paradise. You see, that is also a tragedy of our world. You know, Martin Luther King had this quote where he was, I don't remember it exactly. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Okay, there we go. This is the quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And so if somebody uh, bunkers down in an inner paradise and they become dismissive of the outer realms, it's as if, of course, world peace can be instant in the inner realms. In the outer realms, it is the management of 8 billion inner realms. And what kind of expression they have. Really, the destiny of the human species is not on, on the shoulder of individuals. It is on the expression of all, everything. <clears throat> <laughs> Imagine there's like some, you know, dictator about to press a nuclear button. It's like in, in the nuclear room to press the nuclear button. And let's say the dictator doesn't want to press the button. But suddenly, like there is a cat in the corner of the room and it startles the dictator and they accidentally hit the nuclear bomb. Do you see? It's as if everything has, <laughs> every part of life has a sort of uh, connection to the future of the whole thing. Now, if in the future, let's say, a child opens its eyes in the world and it went to the beings that are already in that world and asked, what kind of world am I in? And those beings said that you're in a world where the advancement of this collective system is prioritized, the efficient advancement, over the selfish individual. Because the thing about, I would say, the selfish mind is that it's a choice to be with yourself. It's the fear of the new, which I think it leads to selfishness. Or fear of how the unknown will happen.
pretty much uh, the structure I'm envisioning is simply that first we acknowledge on this planet that every person has an inner realm, outer realm. Then we acknowledge that in the outer realms, our greatest uh, potential is our greatest vision for every individual. We build a world where there is honor in every angle. It's as if, imagine, you're a janitor at a school, you know, and in an advanced civilization, they ask the person, what are you doing? You know, and it's like the janitors, let's say, behaving in like the most incredible way, the best janitor on the planet, and you ask it, and the janitor is like, it's for the advanced civilization. As if in the background context of the world we're living in, misery, suffering, and inefficiency are no longer in the holding the steering wheel. You see, it's as if we have one lifetime to not just tell the greatest story to ourselves, but to live it. One lifetime in the, through the physical format. I feel honestly, the species is uh, has outgrown war, the inner realms. You know, it's as if when it comes to information, people are like, oh man, you know, I don't, it, it's as if like, <laughs> for information, there is no war, right? Or let me say it this way, um, a person can read the history of another country and that country doesn't get offended. You see, when it comes to inner realm reality, we have an incredible globalized tolerance. But when it comes to outer realm activity, it's still, you know, the human being has to put on a mask to, to have a specific individualism. Pretty much if we look at reality before consciousness, think of it as a sort of singular non-existential dimension. And as we have gone through time, it has become more and more multidimensional. First, the multidimensionality was the consciousness of a biological body to the world. Like the body realized, the, like the, I call this the unconscious self, the body noticed it's separate from the planet. Then the mind, the consciousness of the individual realized it's separate from its body. And so then the person could be an individual with a name living in a story of the world. The thing is also that if emotions were seen as water, uh, decency and in, indecency and de indecency would be as if dirt in the water. <coughs> there is no one story, of course, but there is a path that the species can take. If the person wants to see how advanced the species would be, Then they're, then they're living in accordance to their collective self. You see, the issue is that individuals are living as individuals, but if individuals lived as a global collective, that means think as if there was an ideological system which was called, let's say, pure humanism. And so before any ideological system colors the human being it's as if we're all just creatures in the realm there is there has never been you know the evil and the good come from the actions but when it comes to just the value of the human we're just a natural or biological organism honestly if we didn't have minds there would be no question of what is meaning because we're living or we are centering our lives on around meaning <clears throat> and if we're not content with the past meaning is uh, undiscovered you know? it's just the background story of the world there's a better one and if that better story comes into place,
if human beings begin treating each other as multidimensional beings rather than just uh, what they see, a lot of conflict goes away. You see, war becomes easy when one side doesn't see the others. You know, it's as if when it's think of it this way, like uh, two opponents in battle, swords and shield, and then those two opponents, it's as if whichever wins, they have an instantly an expectation that the other will not. You know, it's as if a person doesn't have, let's say, an emotion on their enemy, on their real enemy, because their dismissal is the expectation. Their non-existence is the expectation. In World War One and Two, I think the number was around 75 million, 85 million, somewhere around there, of the amount of people that died. And when you think about that, it's so mind, it's just sad, because how many of those people could have been geniuses that could have, could have advanced civilization? Because we as a species cannot discriminate between our inner realm and outer realm, there's endless turmoil. But if a person can just realize that their inner realm is their private world and the task or the challenge or the fun puzzle of life is to, is to not is to be conscious of your private world your inner realms and to also be conscious of the outer realms and in accordance to the outer realms adjust the inner realms and sometimes if you're creative you adjust the outer realms with the inner realms you see it's it's like a psychological mismanagement of a creature uh, is collectively leading to leading uh, is collectively projecting pretty much human beings uh, because they don't care for the future of the world it is easy to be small and ignorant you know back in the day you know, kings were not, you know, some kings, the people didn't like them. But when war came, when there was war against the kingdom, suddenly everybody cared for the king, right? And for me, the king of kings is the advanced civilization when it comes to the outer realms. In the inner realms, the king of kings is an inconceivable force, witnessing force. So if a person has an expectation for the advancement of their species, any, it's like how emotional will that person get? Sometimes I look at myself and I'm like, how? <laughs> you know, I'm like, like the emotion you have is as if not just caring for the potential future. It's, it's like caring for the future of 8 billion creatures and more. You see, we have experienced individual success, we have experienced individual failure, we have experienced collective failure, we have not experienced the ultimate collective success. <clears throat> because if you were a Buddhist, <laughs> I'm going to bring Buddhism into this, because if you were a Buddhist, you'd be like, okay, I'm living in a world where I might reincarnate in again. And then you'll see, like, the advanced civilization is the ultimate idea that connects to every other outer realm projection. It's as if healthy species build advanced civilizations, unhealthy species uh, uh, fade out in the anguish of an existential void. You see, it is our greatest retaliation. It is the greatest human counterattack to emptiness. This is honestly my heart's vision 
hopefully I'll, I'd be a part of it <coughs> in this life. But for me, I hope to see, just like we have hospitals where it was like a bunch of doctors that just gathered around and they are like, okay, let's start a building, you know. We have advanced communicator associations everywhere. assisting every aspect of life let's say every social worker or public servant you know whether it's the police firemen uh, paramedic it's as if there there would be an advanced communicator assisting and the task of the advanced communicator is to be conscious of the inner realms and outer realms of individuals and the intensity of exposure you know, it's as if, why are there ratings uh, for films? You know, because the content's exposure can, in some sense, lead to paralysis. Advanced civilization is the future's birthright. And as every human being climbs out of how their inner world has convinced them of truth, and they find themselves in an unknown outer world, that is where great advancement begins. That is how genius, I find personally, how genius is born. You see, the idea of genius is suggested that it's connecting dimensions that were never connected before. And if you think about a human being with the past, the human being has to come to the present. They have to find their presence prior to their inner realm ideological movement. And when they are in the presence, there comes this very strange feeling. You know, people are trying to be happy in this world, that's great. But when you look at reality, it is so bizarre. Just the, its placement, just the fact that we are on a hovering sphere in an edgeless space, filled with countless celestial content. You know a reason why civilization 1.0 is being dishonest? Because if it was to be truly honest, it would have to acknowledge the presence of the unknown prior to any knowledge. Which is another way of saying the, the true activation of the human being is experiential, it is not ideological. That means greater than any speech is that moment when your eyes realize the possibility of a giant occurrence. To me, the advanced civilization, it's the vision of it is like a giant where I have had the privilege, at least in my inner realms, to, to be on its shoulder. The future will happen. And how it will happen depends on the advanced communicators and how the advanced communicators use the technologies in the outer ones. <clears throat> and so personally to myself, so that I don't get overwhelmed, there's a saying in the Bhagavad Gita, I'll say this, where the Bhagavad Gita is this uh, ancient book where <clears throat> um, there's this archer and God comes and has a, a God, Krishna, the avatar of God, has a conversation with Arjuna, this archer. And there's a part, there's a chapter of it where God decides to reveal his true form to Arjuna. And he does and it blows Arjuna's mind to the point that a sort of fear comes. You see, there's a fear in existence. And then if the person's inner realms are very, they, they occur in a very unique manner, there comes a fear of what existence is, not what's happening in it. 
So when God reveals his true form to Arjuna, it is so overwhelming that pretty much Arjuna freaks out. And for me, when I think about the potential of how advanced human beings can be, not only am I just, it's, it's like, it, like that idea of an advanced civilization was love at first sight for me. <laughs> but it's just so vast, so beyond, that it's as if, if you expect an advanced civilization, the turmoils of 2020 are not, 2022 are nothing. The type of suffering and problems we have in 2022, if you think about how advanced the potential of the species is, is it's like there's nothing to worry about. Do you see? Not nothing to worry about, but it's as if you, it's like, think of it this way, in an expectation game where emotions are defining the being, I'm just this guy suggesting that whoever you are, if you just for a second consider that it is the most ultimate honorable consideration, this vision of an advanced civilization, you will honorably function in reality. An honor that is in some sense as untouchable as the context of the world. You see, it, we, we are so, we think knowledge or that being an intellectual is about knowing concepts. That is, the, that is the biggest flaw of the educational system. You know, because in some sense it is to know the context. If right now I have this view that the context of the world is God's will, then it's as if I'll just chill out. You know, it's as if, it's like, why, why should I say anything when it's as if truth is already where it is, you know? But when I look at it from a context like, okay, okay, sure, I can close my eyes and feel a sort of universal divinity, but in front of my eyes, there are human beings on this planet in poverty-stricken countries, which these human beings are uh, clawing and crawling towards a modern humanity but when we look at modern humanity it has in some sense given up on itself through the fear of a miserable outcome it's as if the inefficient the spirit an inefficient spirit has put which is the ethos the world story has possessed the species in in 2022 as i'm speaking you know, to me, you know, of course, people are like, okay, this is just some guy giving a podcast. But to me, I, I am alive in the most unique moment. People don't realize how val how uh, how incredible it is to be alive right now. Not because of the things you can do, but just because we are at the pioneering phase of a very sophisticated cyberspace culture that will arrive in the future. You can even see its karma. Right. Sometimes I see how something moves, and you, you, you're the, in the mind can fathom uh, how that movement can amplify in the future. But at the same time, we're at a point where creatures have awakened from their existential slumber uh, to an experiential ability to communicate the worlds behind their eyes think about it the early cavemen like you know i mean of course the earliest art is like some caveman went in a cave put his hand on the wall and just you know put like you know red powder like you know uh red pigment over it and it was like the first artwork it was an expression of an inner realm intent you know the earliest artworks are not content oriented per se they are intent oriented what I mean by that is that uh, the, when you look at art's origin, it was uh, the intent of life, you know. Then, now you look at art, it is sub-level de deviations of the true natural intent of, uh, you know, art, let's say. attitude towards uh, my emotions for this idea of an advanced civilization civilization 2.0 is that uh, on some level I feel like a gardener 
know, the gardener waters the plants, you know, plants the seeds, but is not there to see the whole thing happen. You know. But there will come a time. I mean, it's, it's just the most common sense thing that um, the human being, individual human being, gets bored. So imagine there's someone who's suffering and you suddenly get bored of your suffering. You're like, okay, how long am I gonna suffer like this? It's pretty boring, you know, so pretty repetitive, <laughs> you know? And uh, so now imagine the species will get bored of its own inefficiency. And uh, it is not ignorance to have great expectations for a world you're in once. Because really, if you think about it on an individual level, what is connecting us is, as human beings is our association with a collective movement. That's why we're all living in cities. And those people who, let's say, go into nature, subconsciously they still care for a collective movement but they're there to see nature's collectivity you see it's like an experiential path an existential path and within the experiential path there is an ideological path language is the main uh, it's it's language is the inner operating system uh, of how a species uh, realize that its experiential uh, presence uh, was the source of any advancement. <clears throat> and of course, I, I feel that, uh, you know, every person's different. I've, uh, sometimes I go into situations pretty much like someone, imagine you're going, walking in a museum and you're not touching anything in the museum, you're just passing it by. Many moments I've just been a passerby in the moment, like there was something happening and, uh, you know, I was, I, I was having an experience and I was just there, not having an expectation on anything. And in those moments, the emotional inner realm didn't change. The ultimate advancement of a material entity is towards space, of course. You know, we, we could have this view that outer space is just emptiness, or we could have this view that space is the ultimate evolution of matter. So what, what it means is that right now, because we have bodies, I can say, all right, guys, let's build an advanced civilization in the outer realms. But if we didn't have bodies and we were just pure fields of mind, where bodies were like, you know, remote control drones in it, you know, there would be no like there would be no advanced civilization if there isn't an individual like there would be no need for it you know we can even fathom beyond an advanced civilization and it's pretty much like god remembering it's god you know if you want to take a universal life approach to it There has never been in history a cyberspace collective of minds that can decide on the future. what's fascinating and I'll make this my you know one of the final statements uh, eyes open there's an observation there's a worldview accessed 
this world view relates to the inner world view that the person has and so it's as if the response of the comparison of our inner life's expectation on the world to our outer life's expectation it's as if a person can feel they're super confident and then in the outer realm someone can come and say something and it like shatters them <laughs> they shattered like glass you know <laughs> responds to our sight how our eyes hold the world the future's potential activates You know, I am just such a small part of this existence that at best I feel like at least there was someone, you know, there was someone in human history that I wondered if the species would roar towards the advance. I'll say this, like I've had experiences in the chat section of uh, these talks that I give, and um, there's been all kinds of people, different kinds of people, and I've noticed that if I care for the person, their words can choose to shift my inner realms. If I don't care for the person, it's as if I have denied their existence in my mind, and then I don't care about it. You know. But again, it is a changing world. The static, uh, let's say, an advanced civilization uh, is a static view, kind of like uh, uh, the summit of a mountain our species is climbing towards. And then the process of how we build an advanced civilization, that is the advancement of communication. And um, I guess I'll end it here and I'll say that whoever, whoever you are hearing this, um, it would be a good idea if, if you could write in the comment section your view on emotions. advanced civilization is the most efficient actualization of freedom. It is a multidimensional civilization rather than a civilization trapped in dualistic meaning. Because the human being is a participatory animal. It, it, there's, I think in all of us, just through evolution, there's just this feeling that we don't want to miss out on the true show of life. And now we're in the frontiers of it, having an ability to direct it. Civilization 2.0 awaits. Thanks for listening. Much blessings. Man.